I am unashamed. What about you? Do y'all think that was just cheap? I mean, well, I mean, I spend the, I, 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 know I will say this. I spend a lot of money on my yard, so I, you know, I, I'm not the kind. I'm not going to work. I don't mind make, what somebody else does to theirs at all. I know, Phil. I, I get it. So if we're welcome to the podcast, we're uh, we're trying to get <laughs> we're literally over literally amid discussion. And Nate, the Robertson family has a problem with cutting whiskers and cutting grass. It always. <laughs> It always <laughs> it <sparks. laughs> old joke. Wait till the fall comes; it'll lay down. So, Phil, I'm gonna make you feel. <laughs> it used bad. to be a joke. The, wi- now the women a have a different. They have so, a different way of looking at yard stuff. So, Phil, just to catch you up on this, I'm gonna make you feel better. I'm gonna, I'm gonna minister. Some. I bet you are. No, I am. <laughs> so they were helping a guy who who mows. Chase is counseling today, Dad. They're helping a guy out. Uh, who who was you know a missionary at one time? And that makes a, sense. Yep, that unfortunate. I didn't get that info. They say they gave it to me, but and, I didn't get your, that one. And your wife wants to do something about your yard, you know. So so it was actually the two birds and one stone. So here's my comfort to you. So my wife comes in there and says, "Look, our sprinklers are not working. Yep, it's a hundred and." 17 degrees or whatever. It literally is it's 104, feels like 117 in Louisiana. That's not an exact, but that's now, not a Robertson exaggeration. Now you've but. interrupted my train of thought because I, I cannot stand this feels like uh, feature that we have. We'll just call it, we made up the number anyway Fahrenheit and Celsius. We just made it up. So, so why not just call it what it feels like? Why do we have to say it's 104 and it feels like 117? Just call it 117. Well, that's a point. I mean, apparently, I'm no weatherman, but apparently there are other factors, humidity, blah, 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 that go into no, I, this. No, I know. So it's it, not an actual it temperature. It is just a number, right? It is a number. Somebody comes in there and says, hey, guys, it's 104. But it Somebody feels like says, 117. No. It feels like 117. <laughs> what What do you Seems want me to subjective. do about this? It may be subjective. I got I got news yeah. for you. It, let me I'll tell let you me. this. It's hot. That's it. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I haven't announced it's hot it. here. It's too hot. So she says, well, you acclimate, and, you, and well, you acclimate too, though. You acclimate to, the, to whatever it is. When we moved from Louisiana to North Carolina and it was 81 degrees here, I was like, man, this is amazing. Now, if it's 81 degrees, I'm like, it is incredibly hot. So yeah. your your body your body acclimates to wherever you're at over time. We would I would literally sleep outside, Zach, if it was eighty one here. I would feel so cool. No, look, you can't get the, your house. The lows the last week have been eighty nine and the highs have been one oh four. Just think about that window. It's eighty nine. And so uh, you know, what led to this sprinkler conversation, because every time I go through the house, I turn everything down three degrees and then my wife comes through and she turns it back up it, it goes 72 and then i look up and it's hot in here yeah I just turn that thing down i look what's back somebody put it up 72 the uh, somebody there's only one other person living i didn't say house. i think i know who the somebody mm-hmm. is we've been doing this for 33 years so i said well okay she's she's come to me I'm making you feel better, Phil, with this story. Yeah, I, I, so, I, I, I ain't kicked in yet. <laughs> no, no, I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Not worried when the feel good comes in. So far, it's just a bunch of bull. Well, everybody knows I'm not Mr. Fix It, but I thought, how hard can it be? You know, how hard can it oh, be? That's the worst question ever for a sprinkler system. Sprinkler on. That's so a I go disaster. out there, I find this tool. First of all, and it's it's like a big iron thing. Then I realized that this is to turn the water off and on. So that's not it. So I don't need that. So I put the tool back. But I spent 20 minutes looking for the tool. <laughs> then I realized, what do I need that for? This turns the water off in case there's a... <laughs> so I find the little sprinkler thing where it's coming out of the ground. And I thought, all right, well, there's two levers here. So evidently... It's just the water's not on. So I you know, I got Missy. I said, go turn the sprinkler on. She knows how to turn the little box on. Yep. And we'll fix that because I'll just move the levers. We'll get the water flowing. 
So I, she's at one place, I'm at another. I'm like, all right, I turn one of the levers on. I said, try it now. Nothing. So I turn the other one on. Try it now. Nothing. So that was it. I said, well, <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> so you feeling better, Dad? So hold on. Here's <laughs> it. No, here's the part that make you feel better. Still waiting on the water. So she's like, well, you didn't help. You didn't help fix the problem. <laughs> and I said, but I tried. So I said, well, look, I have another idea. So I went, so she's still at the box. So I went and got the water hose, screwed it into the little thingy, turned it on, and I just start watering the grass. <laughs> 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 she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm fixing the problem. <laughs> So you went from automatic to you walking you over. You now are a human sprinkler system. I said, I'll try to put this on my schedule while I'm around, and I'll water the grass. That's going to be great. Here's where the part's going to make you feel better. Until you call a professional to figure out how to get this sprinkler out, which led to the, so now this is my responsibility. And I was like. Well, it's not really anybody's responsibility, but I thought we could work together. I'll do it autonomously, you know. So, I, well, But this should make you feel better, Dad, because what he's saying is at the end of the day, it's not going to bother Jace whether that grass dies or not, but it's going to bother Missy. Exactly. And it's the same with I, your situation I, and mine. I used your line. She said, well, what what is your long-term plan? And I said, well, if it dies, it'll grow back. Yep. And so... No, we called the professional, and I'm sure it'll be a thousand dollars just to turn it on. I'll be shocked if it's less than that. It's a lot. Yard stuff yeah. is high. There's no doubt about it. It's so there you go. It's just it's part of having a wife that wants pretty grass and, and a neat yard, and they so, want it now, and they want it yeah, now because yeah. yeah. it's hot, and they want to help people, which is that's not a bad thing. So now, if it would to help people the people who do that kind of work you want to help them financially business is not good i could see it all right i'm saying your situation is way better than mine yeah i could see it i'm not helping anybody except but as wife. far as walking outside saying we need to keep the water level just perfect on this the grass here and coming in the driveway i would say it's not not worth the money well, well, I yeah. would agree, but to our wives, it it's is. It's not worth it to me. Yeah. Wait yeah. a while, and if you wait long enough, usually in the state of Louisiana, we have an well, average, I, I, average rainfall that's above average. It's good. Yeah, it's usually good. It's this happen. time of year is not don't, but Very rarely do but we But I'll see ask you routes. this, Dad. Did you even know? Did you even realize? Because I've noticed it. Because I'm, you know, I'm in a neighborhood now, so I know stuff like this. That... Mom had had some landscaping done. You got plants. You got, I mean, you got some nice area there now. Have you even noticed it? I mean, you, or do you use it just Not like, really, but right. I just. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. You, you're not looking for, I noticed it. So I noticed when these guys came and did the work, it looked really great this morning. Well, I, I walked so around. So both of you will know, I have not analyzed either one of your <laughs> water hookups and yeah. how to get water on anything. I just. I just don't fool with what you've got going. That's why in that's, that area. I know it. It's not my I yard. It make you feel. If you better. want to spend thousands yeah. of dollars on the yard? Or go ahead. I just don't see the merit in it. Well, I don't either. But it's somebody just, said, "Well, if somebody's struggling financially, and, and, and they they would, and this crew would like you to, for you yeah, to you're help helping them out. That's good. Most things. They'd have told me that. I'd have said, "Well, I'd, I'd have taken." Well, that is part of it. That's true. Because yeah. I know these folks. They've done some work for me, and they are great people. They're missionaries. They do great work for our church. So. Yeah, it's a it's a win-win. Phyllis's husband uh, fell off a roof. Yeah, this happened the day, since we were last about a week ago, and then broke. Uh, I don't think they broke any bone, but it kind of shifted some around in his lower back, and uh, and he was he's he's got a a body suit on that's. A, Mm. So he's, yeah. he's he's he was a good I told injury. Him he bad I told, injury. I, I told him this morning he looked when he had his brace on. I came in, I, I took him some Chick Fil A, tried to make him feel a little bit better, and I told him he looked like a pregnant Iron Man. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which, yeah. which is that's really quite not, the, that's not quite a great look. He was there. very fortunate. The point is, I mean, he, it was about a ten foot fall, 
Can he walk? I, I is mean, he walking yeah, around? but he's he's in Apparently. a lot of pain. He's in a lot of but pain. But the point is, you know, you reach a certain age where you need you don't to get on stay ladders. out of the flower This beds. is back to the original discussion. Uh, You're exactly right. Off I, the ladder. I hit that age. I, off I mean, the I, roof. You, oh. you start crawling up on tall ladders at our age, yeah. you I told are him asking I said, for trouble. Do control. not do that again. Don't do it. Uh, I used to hang the Christmas lights. Oh, do yeah. I care about Christmas don't do lights? It. No. Don't do it. But when I fell off the roof, which I did, I didn't fall off the ladder. I fell off the roof. Yep. I realized yeah. in that moment, I thought, if I can get up, how old were you when that happened, Jace? How old was I? It wasn't that long ago. Seven, eight years oh, this ago. Is, I didn't wait on a yeah. mishap. I waited till I turned 55. At 55, I walked up to a big tree, and we needed somebody to climb it. For what reason, I don't know, but we need to get up the tree. And I had Red the Redneck with me. He was about 30. I said, Red, I've just made a decision. And I, he said, what's that? I said, from now on, you'll do the tree climbing down here, not me. I'm giving it up right right here today in front of this oak tree. I don't climb trees nice. anymore. I'm too old for it. So I quit yep. climbing them, and he kind of took over the tree climbing, yep. you know, plying up ropes up there for whatever reason. Yeah, I quit climbing trees a long time ago, but I, I've quit the ladders as well. So so when I came in this morning, Jay's dad had gotten stung by a wasp, mm-hmm. and I thought it was in here, but it turns out he brought the wasp in with him. Yeah, the good news is when wasps sting me, it's about like a – just a little more than a mosquito bite, and I'm now looking at where he stung me. Yeah, yeah, around the finger. A little red mark. Yeah. So I never did even find out what kind of I, – I, I'm glad there was just one one, one insert going into my finger than two. Two yeah. would have – I didn't see what stung me. So, but I was thinking Brown Recluse, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll probably uh, yeah. leave a mark. So I, I, have, to, <laughs> I have to mention uh, that um, – Yesterday, I preached yesterday, and um, I had mentioned on the podcast that I joked about the state of Arkansas. We love Arkansas. Just I was just joshing. We did. I was just joshing about. And uh, so yesterday, I had an apology yeah, to the state. Yeah, of I, I didn't. I didn't know where you were. You were track all that. But well, Maddie, who's our producer, is from Arkansas. She so she told me she and her husband loved it. So. I'm, I'm now f- it was friends like with a, Arkansas. Like a tribute to Arkansas. It was a tribute to Arkansas. All right, I yeah, think last you know. week, the week before, they 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 were just one the group. It came from Arkansas, a lot of young people in there, but they brought it's probably thirty or forty of them. Well, yesterday I saw you baptizing somebody. Yesterday yeah, we when I walked them. in. Yeah. Well, yesterday uh, I met at least twenty people from Alabama, and they had a bunch of ball players with them. They were all playing in the World Series somewhere around here. No, it's in Rustin. Is that what it, it is? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a 10- to 12-year-old. They're hosting in the town I was born the we were Little born. League World Series. Okay. So that's fine. At Tech? Is that, that's where they're hosting? It's in Rustin. So, must be yeah. a Tech's field. Yeah. It probably is. Well, that, isn't that cool? Well, there were a bunch of them yesterday at WFR. Uh Man, it was exciting. Those kids. Were... I've told you all my little league stories, so that's always fun to me. I mean, it's a fun venture. I've noticed that ESPN has started covering way more games, which Lisa and I love to watch. Yeah. They had to, uh, Louisiana think, and Texas on yesterday. I think those are the thirteen of. Yeah, they were older. They were bigger. Well, maybe I uh, will have to check on that. I think it's the hot, the hot, the top end of it. Let's uh, let's take our first break. So most people take a summer vacation. But, uh, Dad, they have a name for what you do. It's called a staycation. Yeah, I've had it for years. <laughs> exactly. That means you just stay home. Well, you know, while others go, you just do your vacation right where you are. And so one, our friends at uh, Fast Growing Trees say you could go and view other people's beautiful uh, landscaping and gardens, or you could just stay and have your own. So that's what Dad is doing uh, pretty much every year. FastGrowingTrees.com. Uh, has thousands of easy to grow plant, shrub, and tree varieties. Uh, they come to your house, they're ready to roll. Uh, Lisa and I have uh, gotten some uh, palm trees for our southern layer uh, and some other plants as well. And so they're really good. You don't have to have a green thumb uh, because they have experts that are a Zoom chat or phone call away. So they'll walk you through if you're having any issues. They have a 30 day alive and thrive guarantee, which means they're going to look great right out of the box. And um, you have any problems, you can send them back, but you're not going to. They're great. 
Uh, join almost 2 million happy, fast-growing trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash Robertson right now to get 15% off your first order. So that's 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash Robertson. All right, let's get into this. So Jace is rare. He's raring to go, Zach. I love this section. I spent more time studying this than usual because it was so good. So we uh, let me just kind of reset us to get us. We're, we're going to be talking about the, they call it the parable of the Good Samaritan, but you could call it a lot of things. I thought would, about you, would you agree? This I, I thought about this, how to depict this. I, I think this is the most second famous parable. Behind yeah. the uh, prodigal son, yeah, yeah. Or, the, or the loving father. Harry yeah, Lord. yeah. Harry, again, no, you're yeah. right. I mean, that's that's what I think. No, I think you're right, and I think it's you know when we first started the book of Luke, we talked about him having unique parables from the other gospels, and both the ones you just mentioned are unique. And so I, I think he zeroed in on some things that was interesting the other writers didn't. But just to catch us back up to where we were, because for us it's been a few days since we did a podcast. We talked about this um, expanding of missionary when Jesus sent out the 72, or 70 or 72. And you, if you remember, I, I wanted to mention, go back to Luke 9, 51. Remember the sons of thunder, um, James and John, wanted to fireball the Samaritans because as they were going by there, they, they were rejecting of the message. And so we had talked about that previously, but we're back to a Samaritan story, so I thought it was interesting. But I wanted to bring one thing up that I don't think I'd brought up in either of the other podcasts, is that there's always a mindset, that, and Jesus shows you that when he said, no, we're not going to fireball the Samaritans, because he's, he's, you know, Luke's about to tell a story of how Samaritans are as deserving as anybody else's salvation. But there's always been a mindset of God to want to save people even in the worst possible situation. I mean, like he's shown that consistently and, and sometimes God gets a bad rap because it's always like, well, he's, you know, you serve this God you claim and all he wants to do is judge people. And it's like, you know, just waiting to kill people. But you read stories like Jonah and a lot of other in Sodom and it's Gomorrah. It's the opposite of waiting on you to make a mistake and then he'll judge you. That's right. Under the new covenant, which is coming fast, it's coming near and it's, it's at hand, and he says in Luke 9 there, but they do, he said, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man's going to be betrayed now and fall into the hands of men, betrayed by the hands of men. And they were like, they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp, grasp it, and uh, they were afraid to ask him about it. There was just a lot of confusion the kingdom is near. John the Baptist is ranting on his rant. And, uh, and I mean, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. And he's identifying the ones who are going to be unleashed on the Savior of the world. It's just a lot of material that f- flowed before Jesus actually died, was buried, and raised from the dead. Yep. He, had, he, he was getting them ready for it. But you, how do you get somebody ready for, for that? Say, look, let me, let me explain something to you here. Uh, it's Jesus, we've been following. They, they fix to kill him, string him up like an animal. I mean, on the sidelines, when they're talking about it, they're saying, he's, what did he say? Right. Some, some, something about raised from the dead. Uh, they, they, they still didn't get it at this stage. Right. No, which I think it's a perfect. And a lot of them don't get it at the stage we're in and, I'm still and yep. 2,000 years later. It's a perfect point to illustrate, though, what happens in Luke 10. If you put this into three categories, the message of the kingdom, just think about what he's doing. They're going around saying the king is here. He then gets into loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yep. And love your neighbor as yourself. And, of course, then the debate's going to come up because— Against such the things, expert, there is no law. Yeah, the expert in the law is like, well, who's my neighbor? So really you're seeing the work of the triune God in this because when you think who's my neighbor, eventually, spoiler alert, I'm going to give you the answer. Anyone. Yeah. God, God loves everyone. He wants this father-son relationship with every human. 
male or female, you know, to quote Galatians 4. But so I think it is, this is a moment here because it's a model that we're going to reproduce post-death, burial, and resurrection. Because you think about, well, what do we do today? That is correct. We go around and say, the king is real. His name is Jesus. We share Jesus. We do mission work, kind of the way God was, you know, using He was speaking Jesus. here before it happened. We're looking at it 2,000 years later. Looking back. But same, same story, but it just. Where I think we've missed it, you know, in the church or religion is this act of, you know, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's not just about the ministry. All of these things matter. It is about, you know, I heard one one writer call this neighbor gospeling. You know, it's like <laughs> this is part of it. You, you you can't do it's not about well let me just give your neighbor share. the good news yeah well even more than that though you you know you help them out you look for opportunities it's like somehow or another we divide this into categories because you got to remember the priest and the Levite which we're gonna gonna read about it wasn't like he chose bad people that walked by he picked the best the people who were conscious of people in need right well why did he do that it wasn't it wasn't unlike anything we would do. I mean, this was a dangerous scenario. They were, are they going to risk their life? They they could justify walking by. But we'll we'll get into that further. But I'm glad you brought up the Samaritans, Al, from the previous chapter because somehow we've got to capture the hatred that they had for each other because yep. the story do- loses its weight if you don't realize these are their enemies. They're mad. They're bitter at each other. And that's why they're wanting to rain down so, fireballs on and them. So I've told the story before, and I'll tell it briefly. The northern part, there were 12 tribes in Israel, and then 10 tribes got taken away in 721 B.C. by Assyria. And when, when they were repopulated, it was just a hodgepodge group of everybody. In other words, they were intermarrying with Gentiles and idolatry. And so what happened was, this is over 700-something years before we're reading this, so these people in the minds of these other two tribes that are left down in Judea and Jerusalem, they look at these people as the scum of the earth because at one time they shared the same DNA in their minds, but now they don't. Yeah. So that's that's why there's so much. And they would even probably look as even more favorably on a Gentile than they would on a Samaritan yeah. because they were mixed. And so they saw them as false, idolatrous, all that. So that well, explains the background of why it's so bad. Yeah, and there's you can read a lot about it in the Old Testament, but they, you know the Assyrians came in and basically they, I mean, they called them half, the Samaritans half-breeds right? because while they were off, I forgot the circumstance, rebuilding the temple or, you know, they just a certain amount of these people started having sex with the Syrians and their, their crew began to grow. And then, you know, the Jews called them half breeds. And so they, they were out. So eventually when I was reading through history and Phil, uh, you'll appreciate this, you know, Josephus recorded that the Samaritans at some point, you know, they built their own, Temple, yeah, temple and synagogue on another mountain, <laughs> their own mountain, which is, well. the, which is which is the one that the the woman at the well That's asked right. Jesus about. That's Our exactly forefathers right. worship on the mountain up here. The Samaritans, your people worship in Jerusalem. Where do we worship? Exactly. And do you know that I looked at so current day? There's about eight hundred and fifty Samaritans still here, and half of them live on that mountain. Right now, you go over there. <laughs> so I just thought that was so strange when people think that this, the Bible is just some collection of fairy tales. You know, it's and yet there's people still like, saying the same thing. Oh, they're still they, that it, it's still going on. Still a thing. This is like the Hatfield and the McCoys times ten million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they still hate each other. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of differences in what they believe, but there's a lot of similarities. You know, the Samaritans, they're like. Because they're kind of come from the same Judaism model, except right. they, their Bible has five books, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's it. And so, the, the Jews, you know, they go on to Malachi, 
They stop right yeah, there. They missed the Jesus is coming text. And then Bowles was telling us, because, you know, he studies with so many Muslims, that they still embrace those same five books, Jace. Mm-hmm. And uh, which yeah. I didn't really know that until I talked to him because I haven't studied with a lot of uh, people in Islam. So it's interesting how those five books, the the, the Torah, how what an impact they have on, on a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. So I think we should read the John 4 passage, though, where it said... Uh, four nine says the Samaritan woman, because that that's why you got to realize people. Before I read it, uh, they got so upset at Jesus, because they're like, "How dare you start associating with Samaritans?" Mm. I mean, this is what made 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 them so angry. Yeah, because even yeah. in that story, it says Samaritan woman said to him, "You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman." Well, for us, that doesn't mean anything. She was like, "So, how?" Can you ask me for a drink? Well, then in parenthetical, it tells you, for Jews, do not associate with Samaritans. This was, I mean, Jesus broke a lot of cultural rules here. You, you're not alone with a woman, you know, in public. She's a Samaritan. You know, they're our enemies. We hate them. So had, there's, there's a real. She had a sordid past. I mean, there was a lot of bad well, stuff yeah. going on there. Unless you're Jesus. Exactly. All right, so let me read this text, and then we'll we'll jump into it. So, and remember, at the he had just told his disciples, as Luke records it, um, "Blessed are the eyes that see what you see." For I tell you, many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it. And this is Luke you, ten what uh, ten twenty three and twenty four, uh, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So he, you know, he he has this big blessing moment for the disciples. And then we get to 25. On one occasion, so so Luke is interjecting thing. I'm not sure how everything's happening in a timeline, but here he puts this story in right here in this in his book. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, which whenever you see it written like that, you already know we could probably got a heart issue. Um, teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Same question, um, the rich young man had asked about, remember? Yeah, I think there's a couple of other. Yeah, it's it it two or three times. What he, is did it? Luke, he did it in Luke 18. He said, which is, I, let's camp here for a second, because this, I think he's actually, this is the bigger picture. The question that they all asked is, what do I do? What do I have to do? Um, he asked it, the rich young ruler asked it, and then Jesus said, in Luke 18, he says, what are you talking about good? <laughs> you know I mean, yeah. who's good? And he has that whole, Another time that it's asked in a different kind of way is in John 6 when they're talking about he just fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And then these people are like, you know, give us a sign so that we'll know you're the guy and we'll know you're the one. And and they said, what? He said, they don't understand this whole concept of bread. They said, well, what do we got to do to get this bread? So I think they're. I think one of the reasons why he's a, he's particularly addressing the Samaritan here. And this idea of loving your neighbor is because this was the this was like such a a provocative thing. He's trying to build a bigger picture that you you don't like you're not bringing anything to the table. And they're asking what? Well, how can I add this to what I? Because like, they're they're Pharisees, they're you know, and, and they're and they're Jewish people, and they're there's an attorney and all that. So he's thinking, man, how do what what do I got to do? so that I can earn this and possess this thing called eternal life. But it seems a bit of an oxymoron right off the bat. What must I do to inherit? That would be like me asking dad, dad, what must I do to inherit part of your, you know, yeah, what you no, have? That, that's a yeah. better, that's a better thought. Cause I thought that too, when it said, cause it, inheritance I mean, be like, is a gift. It's a gift. What, what could I do to so, inherit? Let me do something good. Tell me what's required. And I'll impress you. Yeah. And then you'll give me in your will something spectacular, right. like uh, yeah. living forever. <laughs> this is like the genie. Yeah. His prayer life was like a genie. You get three what you, wishes. What do you call it? Is that the cosmic the bellhop? Yeah. Yeah. But you know what, Jason? You brought up John 4. I just thought about this. It's interesting because here he's talking to someone who would not like the Samaritan. And in John 4, he's talking to the Samaritan. And they're really both asking the same thing because he's asking, what do I got to do to have eternal life? She's saying, well, 
how, where do I worship at? Like on a mountain in Jerusalem? Like where? And Jesus' answer is it, it, neither. A time is coming. In fact, it's now here. You'll neither worship the Father on that mountain nor in Jerusalem. And I'm probably going to butcher this, but he's he's looking for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and truth. And in both of these texts and, and the same thing in Luke 18 and the same thing in John 6, it's like all arrows are pointing to something. No, all arrows are pointing to someone, and that's Jesus. I, but it's like he's the answer to the question. But it's we're all trying to we're all trying to figure out how can we how can we box in the spiritual life so we can contain it. I can I can earn it. I can contain it. I can control it. And Jesus is like, no, nah, paradigm shift. I'm going to blow that whole thing out of the water. I think that's where he's headed with this. Which is obviously what he does. Let me let me finish it. So twenty six, Jesus answers this question with a question, which he does a lot. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he quoted Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus nineteen eighteen. You have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. Uh-oh. So he asked <laughs> here's Jesus, a, here's the attorney coming out of here. Here's the, here's the lawyer. And yeah. who is my neighbor? So in other words, we're, we're going to go a little deeper here. So in reply to that, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him. They went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. When I return... I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these, now another question to back to the guy, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer replies, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. It was a lot more simple than this guy thought. <laughs> you think, <laughs> except, except I don't think yeah. this guy was happy with the yeah, way. It, he, you know, it's it's uh it's very similar to he's given this tangible way of basically embody embody me, embody what I do, do what I do, follow me. When he when he talked to the rich young ruler in uh, Luke eighteen, it was a different thing, right? But it was it was a he said I've done all the things that I'm supposed to do. Um, he's, oh yeah. Then she said, there's that one thing you got to do that you haven't done yet. He said, what's that? He said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. And I think that what this description is here in Luke chapter 10, this is the, this is who Jesus is. This is what he looks like and what he smells like. And I think what he said, you want to be, you want to have eternal life. Well, well, come follow me, come do what I'm doing, which at the time this had been extremely difficult you know he asked that question who's my neighbor he probably shouldn't ask that question honestly but that that's the part that we got to explain so why would he ask that you know just think about it why why is he asking well who's my neighbor because really he doesn't want to love everybody (laughs) well i think at this point you, you got to remember, this has gone after the rail, off the rails, because you have a scholar, and not not a he's y- y'all are referring to him as a lawyer, but it's not a civil attorney. No, he's a, just an expert in the law. Right. But he's having a he's challenged this guy Jesus to a debate, and what he doesn't realize is Jesus actually wrote this, <laughs> which yeah. is and everyone, <laughs> including this dude. It's guilty as charged on breaking it. Well, and I think yep. that's the underlying point that's not, you know, if you're not really getting in this in depthly, you miss. Because Jesus actually, which I, he did a number of things that none of us would do, which is makes you realize that we're always worse than we think. Because mm-hmm. he asked him a question, what must I do to, 
inherit eternal life. If anybody asks us that, the last thing we would do is then ask them two questions. I just guarantee it. If somebody said, well, here's what you need to do, and we'd sit them down, and you know, you asked me the question. So he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he, Jesus responds, two questions. What is written in the law, and how do you read it? Well, this guy got it right because he, he gave a summary. Of, now, it's easy you know, for us to know what the law was pointing to, but it would have been difficult for someone back then to cut through all the whatever, at least the Ten Commandments. Does he answer what Jesus answered when someone asked him what's the greatest commandment? Exactly. It was a very impressive answer. I mean, he got it. The point of it was to love God. And to love your neighbor. So, so just look at the, if some of you are new to Bible study, just look at the Ten Commandments. The first few are about loving God, That's and right. the last few are about loving, loving people. your neighbor. You don't, you know, when you get to the end where it says you don't, don't steal from them, you don't kill them, you don't, you don't sleep, sleep with, their, with wife. their wife. Yeah, right. So he, he got that right. Where it all went off the rails for the expert is he's like, Jesus said, well, go do it and you'll live. There's where you got to read between the lines because then you realize I can't do that. That's right. You can't love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your he neighbor. He recognized as he had fallen short. Exactly. He, he recognized it. So and that's why it says, but he wanted to justify. He probably felt pretty good about his heart loving God, maybe like the rich young ruler who yep. said, Look, I've kept these things. So. He says, well, who's my neighbor? Because let's get it down to what the, let's get more specific. Right. Then I'll let you know. Because you can't expect me to love everybody. Well, yeah, not surely not the Samaritans, which is why Jesus chose the Samaritan exactly. as the hero. And look, you notice what he did in here, what I think is subtle that makes Jesus a lot smarter than everyone else. If he would have just told the story where he had to help a Samaritan, oh, he would have never continued to listen. If it would have been him, he's like, you you have to help Samaritans. That That is your neighbor. He's like, hey, that's going off the rails. <laughs> but he wanted, to, he wanted to soften his heart. So what he did, did was he basically put the expert in the law in the ditch who had been beaten and robbed. Because he said a certain man, and he didn't describe mm -hmm. who the victim was. And he had the hero as the Samaritan, because <laughs> right. then he realized, let's say you were dying in a ditch. Would you rather this Samaritan who you hate help you so you could live, or, or do you just want to die? <laughs> <laughs> so it, so the debate, Jesus won right there. Yeah, Because everybody on the planet would say, even if it was your enemy, if you were fixed to die, you would want the mercy. You would want to live because he appealed to a survival instinct. That's right. And we would all in that moment, you're like, wait a minute here, I'm dying here. And they're like, oh, well, I thought you didn't like me. You're not thinking that in that moment. You're, you're thinking, please help me. And you don't care who it is, right. where they're from. So that, I think that's the no, point. It's, it's like I saw this video recently. This woman was, was drowning. Of course, there's somebody filming it, you know, which, again, put, put your stupid phone down and go Man, help, help the drowning woman. But anyway, I'm watching it, and this guy swims out there and and saves her. And, and I thought in that moment, I thought, these two people, she was a black woman, he was a white man. And in the world we live in, a division where there's racial, political, whatever, you could have a lot of different things going on that they probably disagreed on. But in the moment when you're – literally drowning when someone jumps in to save you, none of that other stuff matters. No. What mattered was somebody well. saw a drowning woman and jumped in and saved her. And it doesn't matter yeah. what party you belong to, what your race is, your gender, anything. Which is a big, I mean, that's a big part of, of I think the whole kind of, I think it's a key part of Jesus's ministry. I mentioned this on a previous podcast, but in Mark, whenever he cleansed the temple, which we always want to make it about, you know, that they were selling stuff in there, which I know that's part of it. But listen to what he says when he rebukes them. And he was teaching them, saying to them, this is Mark 11, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? 
So there, there's the ideal, is that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So even in, uh, even in this uh, culture, this is a, a Old Testament uh, verse that he's re- that he's quoting here in the old. I mean, he, there is the the picture even in the Old Testament of Samaritans, Jews, Gentiles, black, white, all the different people groups in the world. God wants to bring all of them into His house of prayer. So that was the ideal, but and, and instead of doing that, this is what they did. But you have made it into a den of robbers. So even which I I don't even know if they understood the shocking nature of such a claim. You know that you know the Israel thought they were God's chosen people, and Jesus is basically telling them, no, I'm, "I'm breaking this thing wide open. It's always been for everybody. We're 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 opening this whole thing up to everybody." And so when you get to Luke 10, it's the same concept, right? I mean. He's basically saying that, they, no, I'm, I'm the God of every human, not just a certain group of humans. Which is why when I, we first started this, I, I referenced Second um, Peter uh, 3.18, which was the idea that God wants all people to be saved. You know, as yep. the way Peter put it, yep. and that's true. He's always had a heart for all of his creation. He just worked primarily through the Jewish people to bring Jesus about to come to the earth because of their meticulous nature, to keep track of things, to everything they did to bring us the Messiah. But he's always loved everybody. He yeah. wants everybody to be saved. Well, I think that's yeah. the pattern he's laying out. So, so when Luke 10, when you back up when the 72 returned, you know, and he kind of rebuked them saying— don't rejoice because I've given you these gifts, but that your name's written in heaven. And then all of a sudden he introduces this idea of how the Trinity works in 21. It says, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, which is the guy he's debating with right sure. now, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. So this this is eventually in Luke's account going to get to teaching us how to pray in chapter 11, but it's all wrapped around loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, you know, him using us in our mm-hmm. mission to declare that Jesus yeah. is king and loving your neighbor as yourself. Well, when you think about this from a relationship, father, son, or and kids, you know, kids can be way more radical. Uh, I thought about this as I heard a sermon that tied what happened at the home of Mary and Martha into this these lessons on prayer. I mean, you think about it. A kid is the only person who can wake you up in the middle of the night with just a crazy request, and you'll do it. it yeah. Because, if you know, if you... Anybody else, you're like, well, why don't you do it? But your kid's like, can I have some water? Or, you know, I'm scared of the dark or whatever. And you see that that type of, uh, especially in prayer, you know, with the childlike spirit. But you also see it when it comes to this idea about racism and putting people in a box. All kids, you know, when they're born, they love everybody. Yeah. They're colorblind yeah. completely. Yeah. And so you start seeing why Jesus is giving you this analogy, part of being you know, true sonship and understanding who God is and what he desires, you hear stories like this because you then realize God Hmm. is trying to get you to see the only way you're going to realize to love your neighbor is if somebody else shows you that kind of grace, which is what he did. Yeah. I mean, in actuality, Jesus is representative of the Samaritan here also because he was rejected he looked yeah. like he was from the wrong part of town. You're claiming to be God. Well, what did he do? He stopped, and he did that for every one of us. So I think there's a double meaning here, because then it's I not based on a law or moral, because the that's why he chose the priest and the Levite, because you know they thought about what was right, but they weren't willing to suffer the cost, because this was a dangerous highway that he that he chose. They're like, look, well, that old boy needs help, but I'll, you know, I'll send somebody later. Or, <laughs> but Jesus, he 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 did it. He he. I like your I like your illustration too about the child. A couple of weeks ago, our grandkids were staying over. Our youngest one, Pearl, 
she comes, it's like five in the morning. She comes in there and of course Lisa wakes up and which woke me up and she said, what's wrong? Cause she's assuming, you know, she's sick or something. And she said, Nothing. I just thought we might need to snuggle. <laughs> but, you know, if Zach was staying over the house and Zach comes in at five in the morning and says, well, can I snuggle with y'all? <laughs> Get out of here. You waste <laughs> you think that would that'd be a little strange. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's funny you say that, Jace. We had a friend over um, um, a few weeks ago who, you know, we adopted a child who's biracial. And this particular guy that came over was Asian American and it was adopted by a white family. And of course he's all right my age. And so he was just, I mean, I was just like picking his brain. Like and what was it like growing up as an adopted kid and what, like, t- like, you know, just wanted to know what, like what pitfalls and things. And one of the things he said, he said, I, he said, I didn't even realize that like, because his parents didn't tell him that he was adopted. And I'm like, well, how, I mean, how do you get away with that? Because you're Asian, they're white. And he's like, yeah, they, that's the thing. They didn't tell me. And but he said, it's weird. I didn't even consider it until I was like eight years old. And then the kids at school started to make the distinction. So he didn't even see the, 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 the there was a racial difference between him and his parents until he was eight years old. And, and I started thinking about like Ruth right now. I mean, she's biracial. She has no clue that she looks different than us or that she's a different race. And at some point she'll be, become aware of that. But I'm, I mean, I think about kids and there's like these really cool little memes that you see out there with a white kid and a black kid walking down the street, holding hands. And they, they don't know the things they're not supposed to do or, you know, or even like political differences and things that we d- divide over. And we don't just divide over them. We're like, you're not, you're subhuman because you don't, ha- you don't view the things the same way I do. So I think it is when he says that, that he has hidden these things, but he's revealed them to children. I mean, we all see that to be true with our own kids. Like we see that. We see that in our own kids for a moment. It doesn't last long, but we do see it. Yeah, that's why he's eventually going to get to eleven thirteen, and then says, you know, he he has this illustration about prayer. Because I know I'm jumping ahead, but I really think that's a point. This is where he's going toward when he tells his disciples, not not the crowd. Uh, you know, not a bunch of unbelievers. He tells his disciples, starting in verse 11 of chapter 11, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Because he's talking about prayer, you know, how you pray, which is a famous, you know, the Lord's Prayer, and he says, here's how you pray. But right. he said, Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. And to his disciples, he said, if you then, though you are evil, which is quite a statement, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven, and watch what he says, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Mm. So that spirit of sonship that you see, you know, in Galatians yeah. chapter four, chapter 3 and chapter 4, that's where we're all, that's where we all end up, but we're seeing the beginning of this. That's good. The, the repercussions of Jesus, you know, saying the kingdom of is near mm-hmm. you're you're going to be able to have this father son relationship with the almighty god and have his holy spirit which is going to produce the peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness self control all the things that you need from this radical act of love and grace that's going to happen so then you can look at everybody in that childlike spirit yeah which makes sense yeah. why he's using that il- illustration it also makes sense of what I mentioned earlier in Mark 11, when he talks about you've made my tent, the temple that was supposed to be a house of worship for the nations, you turned it into a den of robbers. So what Jesus ultimately does with that temple, as he says, that's coming down. I'm building yeah. a new temple, which is us. What makes you a temple? You house the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. You invite the Holy Spirit in. Like when, when the Holy Spirit enters into a human being, then that human becomes the temple of God, the temple of, of Christ, where God indwells and lives and his presence is in us. And it's for all people. It's for everybody who, who would, who would uh, freely come to Christ. It's, it's, it, it's offered to everybody, all the nations. I, I think that's so, so good. Well, and I think that's why Luke does such a nice job um, having a unique voice coming from his perspective in his gospel to give us that broader picture. And, and again, back to the beginning, Remember, he was writing it to Theophilus, a Greek, yeah. to share with him this Jewish history, but how it was available for all men. So we're out of time. 
um, for our podcast, but we're going to talk a little bit more about this in overtime. I got several things I didn't get to. I'm sure Jay's does. So we'll uh, continue this discussion in our overtime. If you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed. Not only do you get our bonus segment for today in this podcast, but you get everything uh, that Blaze has to offer. Uh, so check them out. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.